a really meaningful and important opportunity for us as Chevaliers. We're starting our 82nd year on the 1st of March. Uh, we're the oldest independent bookstore in Los Angeles, and we're trying to feed the intellectual needs of our uh, uh, customers and friends. And I couldn't think of a topic more timely or important than the subject we're going to discuss um, tonight. Um, these are uh, a conversation with um, two incredibly accomplished women about an incredibly accomplished woman. Um, who perhaps as much as anybody in the 20th century changed, uh, changed our country. Um, let me introduce uh, to you the, the interlocutor. Um, uh, Connie Rice, uh, who knows that power uh, concedes uh, nothing, wonderful memoir must be read, uh, is probably, um, on the short list of the most important civil rights lawyers in the 21st century. She is a person who uh, has made a handsome career being adverse to uh, police departments and an extraordinary career being their counselor. And it, I can speak as a person in Los Angeles, uh, perhaps as much as anybody with the exception of Bill Bratton responsible for getting the LAPD to uh, act the way police officers uh, should act. Um, it's a joy and a privilege to have Connie uh, here tonight to talk um, with us uh, about an amazingly interesting book, which you have to buy. Uh, and you have to buy it at Chevalier so we can make it through our 82nd year. Uh, Civil Rights Queen, uh, Tamiko Brown Nagin, uh, is the Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. She's the uh, Daniel Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School. And in her spare time, she's a professor of history uh, at Harvard University. Uh, she's won the Bancroft Prize in history previously. And surely this uh, extraordinary book on Constance Baker Motley will be shortlisted for prizes um, as we go through the year. Um, it's just a great, great privilege to have these two extraordinary people talking about uh, Constance Baker Motley. I'll spend one more second apologizing. Uh, having gone to Columbia Law School and having grown up in New York City, I uh, thought I knew quite a bit about Constance Baker Motley. Um, until I read this book, I hadn't appreciated the fact that she argued 10 cases in the United States Supreme Court that um, major Southern universities were integrated as a result of her litigation strategies and her sheer bravery, that she had an incredible political career and sort of as the capstone to all of that became the first uh, black federal judge appointed by Lyndon Johnson. So as we get ready to have our first uh, African-American uh, woman Supreme Court justice, uh, I think the story of Constance Baker Motley is particularly, particularly relevant. So uh, with that overlong introduction, I'll turn it over to Connie, who will unmute and, uh, and interview our guests. Thank you both so much for being here. All right, thank you for that gracious introduction. And uh, Dean Megan Brown, it's wonderful to be with you. Congratulations on the book. Um, I was hoping we were going to have some slides. Uh, do, do, do we want to go to that first? Or, um, yeah, That's let, right. let, yeah, let's let's go to the slides first. But uh, 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 in the meantime, congratulations. It's a marvelous book. Let's look at the slides. Thank you so much, Connie, for being in conversation with me. And thanks to Bert and Chevalier's Books for hosting me tonight. I'm delighted to be here. I am going to start with a brief reading from my book uh, on Constance Baker Motley's most famous case, and that was the battle to desegregate the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss. This man has got to be crazy. Thurgood Marshall yelled to Motley in January of 1961, that's your case. Marshall had descended upon Motley's office waving a letter from James Meredith. The missive contained such a preposterous idea 
that Marshall thought the writer must be out of his mind. I am submitting an application for admission to the University of Mississippi, Meredith wrote, and I am anticipating encountering difficulty with the various agencies here in the state. In view of the brewing trouble, Meredith requested Marshall's legal assistance. After Marshall finished laughing about Meredith's proposal to sue Ole Miss, he washed his hands of the case. Marshall knew that Motley had the smarts and the courtroom skills to do the job, and he thought her gender would be an advantage. The fight to desegregate Ole Miss might get someone killed, but in the context of Mississippi's white supremacist, yet chivalrous culture, as Marshall saw it, a black woman would fare better than a black man. Any white supremacist, he opined, would scarcely think twice about murdering a black man, but might hesitate to lynch a black woman. The very idea of a black woman lawyer violently clashed with the worldview of Dugas Shands Esquire, the white male lawyer who defended Old Miss. Shands refused to address the ink fund lawyer in the customary manner as Mrs. Motley. Instead, he used only indirect references, calling Motley her or she. At one point early on, Motley jumped to her feet in a bid to put an end to the charade. But the tipping point occurred when Shans called her Constance. Motley immediately objected. I would like for Mr. Shans not to call me by my first name, Motley insisted. Henceforth, the lawyer referred to Motley as the New York Counsel. After months of struggle and endless delays, Meredith had had enough. Browbeaten by white resistance, Meredith wrote to Motley, resigned. I will not attempt to obtain an undergraduate degree from the University of Mississippi, the letter proclaimed. Keenly aware that Motley, who had poured herself into the case, would be disappointed in his decision, Meredith pleaded for understanding. I am human after all, he wrote. Meredith had grown tired of waiting for a deliverance that never came. Life had passed him by. His peers had graduated from college, begun careers, and moved on with their lives. In the meantime, he and his family had endured a high cost, literally and figuratively, fighting to integrate the University of Mississippi. Motley was stunned by this message. In order to salvage her case and support her client, she morphed from lawyer to therapist, a role she often played in high stakes civil rights cases. To get a handle on the fraught situation, the pair would talk in Motley's New York City apartment where Meredith could taste freedom. There, Motley cajoled Meredith. She persuaded him that he had gone too far and that too much had been invested in the case by the Ink Fund and by the Federal Court of Appeals to abandon the litigation. Just as Meredith reached his breaking point, support arrived, precisely as Motley had promised. On September 10th, 1962, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black intervened, halting any further action preventing James Meredith's matriculation to Ole Miss. While in Mississippi, Motley built community with a small band of lawyers and activists who took part in LDF's effort to end Jim Crow in the state. She leaned on Medgar Evers, the NAACP's most prominent operative in Mississippi, who often invited Motley to his home, where she enjoyed home-cooked meals and fellowship with Evers, his wife, and their children. But only one month after Motley left Mississippi for the last time, Medgar Evers was assassinated. It devastated her. Motley couldn't get out of her bed for weeks following his death and couldn't even bring herself to attend his funeral. Nevertheless, she left the state victorious. Constance Baker Motley emerged as one of the most lawyers, respected lawyers in America. A story in the New York Times titled Integrations Advocate captured the professional heights to which Motley had soared. A tall, striking woman, with piercing dark eyes is almost always in the courtroom in the eye of the hurricane surrounding the struggle for civil rights in the South. Motley's fight to desegregate Ole Miss brought her public esteem and professional success 
along with devastating loss and profound pain. Thank you. It makes us realize that uh, we face nothing compared to what the lawyers of the Inc. Fund faced back then. The, the terror she must have felt having to go into Mississippi, knowing the risk of death. Did she talk about that or was it just her steely sort of over, you know, wash over, water off the back of a duck? How did she deal with the fear of having to do battle in a South that was so primed to kill? Yes. And that is a, a great way to ask the question because that was the reality of the situation. When she uh, traveled to Mississippi and Alabama, uh, she went with other lawyers and she also was often accompanied by her uh, secretary, Roberta Thomas, and they would talk to each other about their fear um, and would notice just how unsafe they were. When she was staying with Megger Evers, she actually noticed um, how there were bushes or hedges very close to the house where someone could hide if they wanted to do him harm. And that was precisely what happened. Um, and so she, she just had these moments of terror um, which she would talk about with her travel companions. Um, and then she reflected on the danger uh, long after she had come out of Mississippi um, and you know, told stories about driving in the car with Megger Evers, going back and forth from the airport to the courthouse and being tailed by the state police. Uh, Megger, who was more accustomed to this, would say to her, you know, don't look back. The police are on our tail. Put your legal pad inside the New York Times because it, it was literally dangerous work. You did not want to be caught uh, doing this work. And so it, it was, she understood that she was lucky to be alive after she left Mississippi. And that was uh, uh, one of the reasons that she was just so profoundly devastated by Megger Evers' death, it could have been her. Absolutely. It's, it's riveting to think that this band of attorneys at the Legal Defense Fund, and she was the first woman, I cannot imagine. It was hard enough being there when we, there were 10 of us. <laughs> I can't imagine just being one of us. So um, having her as the first generation of women at LDF, as the only woman, did she, how did she change the focus or the analysis for the strategy that that law firm came up with to brick by brick dismantle the wall of apartheid, getting rid of legal segregation, uh, uh, legally, legally ratified and sanctified uh, 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 killings of African Americans? I mean, just the LDF went after the legal infrastructure of apartheid in this country. And with her in the mix, could you tell that, that she helped shape that strategy? Uh, mm -hmm. Which cases to pick? Which clients? Uh, you know, the, the putting those cases together took a lot of social IQ, took a lot of political IQ, took a lot of legal strategy. But they, these weren't just cases. These were the juggernaut that, 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 that took, these cases took apart apartheid. What was her role in that? Sure, um, great question. And I would, I would focus first on her role in the set of cases that culminated in Brown versus Board of Education. She was there um, on the ground. She wrote the complaint that initiated that series of cases and then was deeply involved in all of the research, uh, historical research uh, around the intent of Congress in the 14th Amendment that was vital to the kind of case that the lawyers uh, put on. Uh, and then she was, after Brown was decided in favor of the Ing Fun, uh, I, I should note, um, even as they were celebrating, she actually found herself depressed. 
uh, and depressed because she knew that the case was not going to self-implement. Uh, they were going to have to choose and file hundreds of cases throughout the South in order to make this thing real um, in the lives of African-Americans. And she was vital to that process. Um, going to the University of, of uh, Florida, um, and this is to talk about the, the higher education cases, litigating all of those cases, um, often doing the work that today a junior lawyer would do. So for instance, um, she talks about on the University of Georgia case, uh, cross-examining the university registrar um, about essentially showing using the admission, admissions files of candidates showing that black candidates were treated differently. Her clients were treated differently. Well, Connie, she went through those files herself. So hundreds of admissions files of college students, she went through them herself and chose the ones that would make her point. Um, and uh, you know, was, was on the ground in the University of Alabama case. The first case was not successful, um, but she followed it through to the 1960s, the Ole Miss case. You know, she's the person who is uh, there making all the choices about how to litigate those cases and building relationships with the judges on the Fifth Circuit, some of whom became uh, heroic figures in their own right for siding with the Inc. Fund. Uh, and so she was, she was vital to, the, uh, to those cases, to the successes. And uh, once one pulls back and sees the full range of her impact, uh, it, 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 it makes, uh, me, made me call her uh, relatively hidden stature historical malpractice. People should know about Constance Baker Motley. Like it's not stretching <laughs> to, to write about her, to know about her. She was there central to all of these decisions, all of these cases. One of the things that I found amazing about her background going back, you wonder how a woman in that era, um, even with all the advantages that she had, she had uh, 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 the, the sort of work ethic that comes with the immigrants from, from the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, when you grow up in an all-black island nation, you don't come with as much baggage as 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 uh, uh, African Americans who live in in uh, on, on in the United States. Uh, and you have you, the book kind of pulls the curtain up, pulls the veil up on the tensions between uh, African Americans who are descendant of American slavery and uh, immigrants from the Bahamas and Barbados and the DR and other other Caribbean nations and how there's sort of a built-in sort of superiority complex <laughs> mm. when they come to, when, when Caribbean Americans come to the United States. Her family internalized that. Mm. Did she pick that message up from her parents? And did that, if she did internalize the, the sort of, we're not African-Americans, we're better than African-Americans, did it change when she went to Fisk or did she just kind of resist it and, and uh, uh, didn't take up her parents' cues? How, did, how does she deal with the caste, the sort of a diaspora caste system that, that, that African-Americans know about, but very few others do? Yeah, I, I would say that she did internalize it. She was told time and time again by her father in particular that uh, West Indians, they were, had immigrated from Nevis, were superior, and he really... Uh, talked about how the African Americans, particularly in the South, allow themselves to be debased by Jim Crow. He would not let her or her siblings play with the migrants from the South. Um, so it was it was a profound prejudice uh, uh, against Black Americans. And the way I see it, first of all, I um, interpret it like the sociologist Mary Waters does, and she says that. Uh, Caribbean immigrants, it, it turns out, are immigrants. And in this country, immigrants rise in part often by reading themselves against uh, African-Americans, distinguishing themselves from African-Americans. So it's, it's in that sense, a typical uh, story. And I, I do think um, 
that either because of or in spite of uh, what her father taught her, she became the civil rights lawyer, who of course ends up representing the very people uh, uh, that he looked down on. I also think, Connie, that having that sense of superiority was in a sense helpful to her. When she went to Mississippi and she encountered people like the lawyer for Ole Miss, uh, she was bewildered by him, right? Um, that he would think that he could treat her that way. Uh, she she uh, tells a story about how she put out her hand to shake his hand and it just stayed out there because he wasn't going to touch a Black woman. And she thought, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm from the Bakers of New Haven uh, who, who grew up in the shadow of Yale. And I earned my law degree from Columbia. And what is he thinking? I don't know. And so in that sense, this cultural um, uh, teaching was a shield for her when she went into the South. Uh, at Fisk, I think she, she could see the vast array of the African-American experience, including African-Americans who uh, had parents who were educated, which is, is, it just wasn't something that she would have thought about. Uh, and yet she ended up leaving Fisk and going to NYU, which was more culturally comfortable for her. Um, uh, in uh, lower Manhattan, it was bohemian, it was left liberal. Uh, so a, a very full and, and interesting uh, background there. It seems like her other shields, uh, shields that African-American women to this day also use, there's that, that steely elegance, uh, the, the uh, sort of intense projection of extreme competence, confidence. It's all part of the shield system to make sure that the negative messages that are built in to our cultures from you know, the moment we breathe, it's in our air, the anti-Black bias and the anti-Black female bias is in the air. It, it, those shields create a bubble, they create Teflon, I don't know what the analogy is, but that it's sort of a fierce, uh, it, it, it's like, it's like you, you weaponize the elegance, you weaponize the unflappability and with that very calm, determined uh, grace, you dominate. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can see it in everything from the string of pearls mm. and the sheath dresses, uh, the, the power of that kind of um, strength. So uh, where did she get that from? Because if I'm reading, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know that much about her childhood before I started reading the book. Um, her parents did not uh, say, you know, college, college, college. I mean, we knew mom, dad, our third word was college. I mean, you know, the Rices are pathological achievers. <laughs> and, you know, you, you, you might be five, but you know you're going to college. You have no right. idea what it is. That, those weren't her parents. She, they thought that college was fanciful for a little girl and that she should get a, a nice job where you're needed, like a hairdresser. Um, so where did she get that kind of ambition? Did she see a teacher? Where did that come from? Because if she wasn't, it didn't come from the parents. That's exactly right. They thought that uh, it, it was silly to dream of going to college, much less uh, trying to go to law school because she was told repeatedly, women don't get anywhere in the law. And of course it was a practical thing for them to think and say, um, it is a family that often struggled to have the necessities in life. And so they never could have uh, earned the money to send her to college. Um, she learned uh, about this other world through school from uh, a couple of white teachers uh, who uh, took her uh, aside and would uh, host her for teas and read literature. Uh, she was introduced in racially integrated schools in New Haven to the teachings of W.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson. Uh, and it's in that context that she also learned about Abraham Lincoln and, um, and uh, George Crawford was a lawyer in New Haven. And so she picked up from external influences, the idea 
of, of achieving, of going to law school. Um, Jane Bolin also was a role model, the first black woman to graduate from Yale Law School who became a judge on the New York uh, Domestic Relations Court. So she had role models. Um, and over time, as she went out into the world, uh, she, she learned that she needed to, in a sense, keep herself to herself. Uh, that was the way to survive, to put on this armor, um, to, to put her head down, to do the work, to look, uh, you know, always dressed to the nines, um, to be elegant. And she, that stayed with her throughout her life um throughout her life and it was effective and yet one of the things that i hope i get across in the book is that it, it also was costly um to to live that way and be that way she did allow some people to see behind the mask um and those people saw the full range of her her humanity her sense of humor um and it's just such an interesting question about how, you know, to what extent um, one can sort of break out of that in one's personal life when there's such a premium on just not showing a lot of emotion and always uh, being hyper competent, always performing in a sense. Um, so some, some issues that are still relevant to our time. And the experience that you're describing of her life, uh, I just said, there's so, maybe this is an exaggeration. It's the story of the token, the burden of someone who lives as a token. Uh, you at Harvard, me here, uh, she and, you know, on the vanguard as the first gladiators that took Jim Crow apart. Mm. Um, but the burden of the token, as you said, it's a, it's a two edged sword. You're, you're on tight ropes all of the time. And you have multiple masks that you have to present to all of the different facets you face. You're the first, you're the only, uh, the only African American in an all white group of power has a set of burdens that she bore. Um, when she was on the bench, it was a different kind of tokenism than when she was a litigator. But she lived the life and she had to represent an entire race to the to the to the dominant culture and the dominant race at all times and you could never always performing is that is that how she felt about it i mean that that that's 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 often in the experience yeah so so what i was getting at um connie in my in the the uh, last parts of my previous response is it's hard to know. I, I feel like with Motley um, that the performance became the self. You know um, that she 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 isn't terribly self reflective. And one of the things that was so difficult about writing this book is that she just there, there's very little. Um, very few occasions when she reflects on her struggle, um, when she just opens up. I did find some things and I interviewed family members and colleagues. And of course I researched the secondary literature and I put her um, in conversation with Ella Baker and Pauli Murray and all of these other women who were her friends and colleagues to try to paint a picture um, of her, uh, but I, I do get the sense that there's a melding of her cultural background, which is conservative, it's culturally conservative, um, and her professional uh, pathway into this person who, in some sense, becomes um, very comfortable performing. And it's, you know, it would take a psychiatrist to figure yeah, out how, how, this, how this all works out, uh, but it was effective for her. Yeah, well, I think all, all of us need to be on that casting, uh, <laughs> on, that, on that diagnosis couch. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really amazing to me that you could come through times that were that dangerous, 
you needed the green book. You, you had to watch what you were doing in the South. You took your life in your hands just doing a case. There are some places where that's still the case. I mean, you know, the cops followed us in Georgia when we were doing the McCleskey case, you know, but nothing near the danger level that, that the first gladiators at LDF faced. Would, when she looked over the arc of her life, she could see the retrenchment when she was on the bench, mm. just as Justice Marshall did. And we're now having to fight some of the same battles. We're now fighting, I think I count the fifth national redemption of white supremacy and backlash to progress uh, made on behalf of African-Americans in the 1960s. It's been 50 years of retrenchment and changing, mm. the, changing the law, getting rid of the statutes. Most of the cases I brought 30 years ago, I, can't, I couldn't do today because the statutes have all been revoked. Um, if she were to look at, would she see it as the natural three steps forward, two steps back, the kind of lightning rod progress, the jagged edge progress that we've made on race in this country, always snapping back, making a little bit of progress, snapping back. Um, wh what do you think she would say about this moment now when we're now fighting about whether we move forward as a multiracial democracy? or whether we go back to make America white and Christian again? Mm -hmm. A terrific question. And I have to say that um, one of the things that's so interesting about this first generation of gladiators is how very American they are. They have faith in the system. You know, to spend that time bringing those cases required faith in the system. And you will find um, references by Motley, by Marshall, um, that suggested they really underestimated the resistance, the amount of resistance there would be, um, and how difficult it would be to achieve the principle uh, of Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and so all of which is to say, I think she'd be a little surprised at um, just the the enduring nature of the, the battle that that we're um, that that so few African Americans um, are in you know professional positions are are in uh, uh, or authority figures. I think she'd be surprised by that. Um, and yet she did live to see the retrenchment occurring. She was disappointed, she was unhappy. She also was deeply resilient and she had changed her own tactic and profession because she thought that going into politics was where she needed to be given um, that all of those initial cases had been brought and there was equal opportunity on uh, formally um, at least. And so I, I think that she would be disappointed. She might be a little surprised at how uh, difficult things still are, but there is no question in my mind that she would demand that people keep going, you know, that, that we, we need a new generation of, of gladiators who um, figure out how to work around all of the stumbling blocks. Um, so you have to, freedom is a, a, you know, a constant struggle. No truer thing has been said. Uh, and uh, so that, that's where we find ourselves. Well, in reading the book, it was, it was just amazing to me how many echoes, fainter echoes of what she faced still exist. Uh, the struggle to find you know, enough child support, I mean, to have a family and do this kind of of a pioneer frontier gladiator work in dangerous conditions. Um, I wouldn't even try it. She did it. She actually pulled it off. Mm -hmm. um, it, women are still struggling to find mm -hmm. sufficient support for childcare. They're still struggling to fit into the primarily male cultures of law firms, even including LDF, although LDF is majority women now. It's, it's a completely different dynamic now. But um, uh, uh, the, the things that she faced 
uh, the, the the presumption of you don't belong here, you know, that you're there's no welcome, there's no not a, still not a welcome mat. There's there's not a get out of dodge mat anymore, but there's it's almost a no trespassing. We've we, it's it's gotten a little bit better, um, and in some circles it, it's 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 easy as as melted butter. I mean you, you you know you actually go through the front door, you have passports. So in some small circles you can say that it's happened, but if you look at the overall, there's more segregation. Brown mm. failed. Mm. Uh, the protections we have mass incarceration. We 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 fill, we we built more prisons. We did not do the Marshall Plan from the Kerner Commission. We we threw that in the trash, and we did a war on crime and mass incarceration. Um, all the, the, these massive pushbacks, everything from the Southern strategy at to, to today's uh, election nullification. I think she would find that that shocking. How far the radical the portion yes. of the conservative party that, that that's become radicalized. Um, it feels like the, the point in the history where there was the Klan infiltration of most of our police. Uh, we now have, you know, insurrection um, as a viable political strategy. So when it looks like we're in her big retrenchment, you're saying that she had resilience. What do you think she would advise us to do at this moment when things seem hanging by a thread? Mm. Hmm. I, the, the, I, I would say that she would advise us to use every possible tool available. She really would. Um, so uh, the, the politics, it, one of the things that I was, I was teaching about it actually this past week, um, it, it was in the context of reproductive justice, but making the point about uh, how, at least in a lot of communities, there's been less of a premium uh, on focusing on the local and state politics, um, which is important to do. Um, and she would certainly think about litigation strategies. Um, she would think there needs to be representation in every powerful position that one could uh, possibly find she would be thrilled that we're at this moment in history that a black woman's going on to the Supreme Court. Um, I, I think she would she would encourage everyone to be in on the fight. And I, I also think, um, Connie, that you know I, I myself struggle with um, uh, on the one hand, I, I looked at all of those people who were standing online for hours. Um, to, to trying to vote. And I was so proud of that. And it just resonated with me. I, I know those people, um, you know, I know people who would do that. They're not gonna, they're not gonna be turned back from voting. They, they're gonna stand uh, online for hours. So you have that resilience and um, that desire and demand to be a part of uh, this country and to just keep fighting. I, I think she would just say, keep, fighting and she also would say it's your turn yeah. right it, it's yeah. it's it's and and we would say to the the people who are rising the young people it's your turn you know take the mantle figure it out um and i will tell you something um that you will find amusing uh, which is i clerked for bob carter and went and I always wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. And when I went to him to ask for advice about how I could contribute, he said two things. Um, he focused on um, uh, positions like you know, investment banking and also being a prosecutor. You know, he's go be a prosecutor. We need black people to be prosecutors. And, that's consistent with what we're seeing now, the, um, the idea of the progressive prosecutor. I imagine Motley would support that as well. And obviously one could critique <laughs> that. Um, and I imagine you might, uh, but uh, I think they, they would just say, keep going. No, Judge, Judge Carter always said, do the opposite of what they expect you to do. That's what he would tell me. <laughs> Yes. Um, just one last area that, that I found fascinating. Um, she lived, she moved through the world as a woman on her terms. Uh, she, she bent the physics 
that were designed against her to actually work for her. So she, she had the competence and the control and she defined herself and her world. And she moved through the world as a woman of power. But she did not want to be called a feminist. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, I don't know whether the audience realizes it. If, if, if you're a black woman, you face the racial discrimination, you face the sex discrimination, and then there's something special called compound discrimination, which is the, the special alchemy between race and sex discrimination. Mm, you, get, yes. you, get, you get a compound effect. I did a paper on this in law school. I can remember the, chi, the chi square. Uh, but so, the, so there's an added, there's, there's an added uh, compound impact uh, that, that, that everybody you run into is, is it can 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 hold can you talk about uh i don't know about you but i i face far more barriers as a woman than as someone who's african-american and, and the compound discrimination what would you think she meant when she said don't call me a feminist but everything that i do is what a feminist would do yeah i think it was practical she was a pragmatic person and uh, she made that statement when she was running for office and then occupying office in New York City. And my read on it is that uh, she understood that it would not be to her advantage uh, to take on that label. It's also true, Connie, that she didn't feel a lot of um, camaraderie with a lot of the people who were calling themselves feminists. So she knew Betty Friedan uh, because they had kids at the same New York City prep school uh, but she didn't, she didn't feel like uh, Ferdan was, was speaking to her or had her in mind. Um, and yet, you know, she was friends with Shirley Chisholm, who very much were grounded um, uh, and spoke out against sexism and Polly Murray, uh, who you know, coined the term Jane Crow. And so I think partly it was just a practical decision um, I do think there was some, uh, there's this enduring problem of uh, feminism being associated with white middle-class women and thus being off-putting. Um, but the thing that I ultimately conclude in the book is that she didn't spend time articulating her feminism, but certainly she did it. Um, she was transgressive, uh, just being who she was and showing up in the courtroom. Um, in the South and throughout the country. And then uh, she decided a number of cases as a judge that implemented the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in the context of sex discrimination. Uh, cases that uh, favored women journalists who wanted to cover professional sports, um, uh, cases involving women lawyers famously uh, Blank versus Sullivan and Cromwell, where, where she approved a settlement that led to women having access to the most lucrative uh, sector of the profession. And so there's no question that um, she, uh, she did feminism, but the, the choice to um, not uh, use that label, I, I think, was, was mostly practical. And, uh, you know, frankly, she's not alone. There, there are there are black women in particular um, who would take the the same stance, and so I, I wasn't I wasn't bothered that much by her saying this. Also, because she said it in the context of um, really uh, privileging the struggle that she had been involved in, and that was against racial discrimination. Uh, so I think those those factors explain uh, how she looked at it. But I, I hear you on the impact of, of uh, gender. It is profound. profound. Well, her life is a profound lesson in, in how you do it. If you want to go through life having a tremendous impact nationally, mm. uh, whether she was on the bench, whether she was in the halls of the Manhattan Borough Presidency, uh, whether she was in um, LDF as the first woman, uh, what trails she blazed and uh, with such grace and style and impact. Um, it's, been, it's been an incredible read. Congratulations on the book. I'm being told they want to go to questions, but the audience, if they know anything about me, if it requires me to do more than point and click, uh, who's going to be answering, who's going to be having the questions? 
But I just wanted to say what a pleasure it was to, uh, to interact with you, Dean Megan Brown, and uh, congratulations again on the book. And thank you for bringing this uh, giant of the civil rights uh, revolution uh, to life for us. Thank you, Connie. I appreciate your being in conversation with me. I've enjoyed it. May, may I uh, butt in here because this has been so fascinating uh, for me. And I wondered about really three um, uh, areas that I would like to hear you talk about, which seem to follow up to what Connie was asking about. I'm interested in uh, hearing more about the relationship between Thurgood Marshall, uh, your old boss, Bob Carter, Jack Greenberg, uh, and the transition or non-transition to, to um, uh, leadership of uh, the Inc. Fund. Uh, I'd love to hear you tell the story about her going to the White House to uh, find the news of her appointment to be the first um, black federal judge. And as a, a Yankees fan who remembers the 1977 World Series, if you could put a little more meat on the bones of the Lutke case and the way she handled the, uh, the, the problem of uh, naked Yankees um, and uh, Time Magazine, the Sports Illustrated journalists. Sure. Okay, so let me tackle uh, those one by one on the office politics, in particular her relationship to Thurgood Marshall. You know, she always credited him with with making her career. He hired her on the spot in 1945, even before before she graduated from Columbia Law School, and yet it was a complicated uh, relationship. Uh, she, after she had litigated her first case in Jackson, Mississippi, on behalf of African American school teachers who were subject to a pay disparity on the basis of race, she went back to the New York offices of the Inc. Fund and uh, said to Thurgood Marshall that she actually wasn't being paid what she should be paid and uh, also didn't have the title that she deserved. And he, um, he corrected that, but it's, it's just ironic and, and interesting. And uh, I think there's a lesson uh, in how even in progressive organizations, there can be blind spots and certainly at that time around gender. Um, she, Bob Carter, Jack Greenberg were friends, they were colleagues. Um, and yet the question of who would succeed Thurgood Marshall when he was appointed to the Second Circuit uh, did create tension. Um, uh, Motley thought that she might be appointed to that position. She didn't get the job. She thought it had to do with gender. Um, Thurgood Marshall, that he didn't have the imagination to put a woman in that position. Uh, and she also thought that it had to do with race. Um, you know, you have to consider that this was just six years after Brown versus Board of Education, and a lot of Black lawyers thought that uh, it would send the right signal for a Black lawyer to succeed Thurgood Marshall. Um, and yet, as I said, I'll, I'll sort of close the circle. Um, she was disappointed, but they, they went on in their relationship. They were good friends uh, throughout their lives. She admired him and uh, was incredibly grateful to him for supporting her career um, all of those years. Uh, you asked about the, I remember the Yankees, there was something else you wanted to Being summoned to the White House for some uh, news. Yes. yes. So, you know, she had been um, under consideration for a federal judgeship for a very long time. She knew about it even before she became Manhattan Borough President, uh, but things, uh, they, these things can take a long time for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons because of the foot dra dragging of uh, Robert Kennedy. Um, and then finally she got the call. Um, she didn't know that she was getting uh, the call, but she got a call to come to the White House. And she went there with her husband and her cousin, and she is invited in to talk to LBJ, who is a physically imposing person. Uh, and he just says to her, well, we're gonna, we're gonna announce your nomination to the bench today. And uh, it's one of those circumstances where 
it's something that she wanted and expected, but when it actually happens, it, it was uh, a bit overwhelming. And um, she actually said, and I think this was just because of nervousness, are you sure we're gonna do it today? And he said, well, I guess we could put it off. And she's like, no, 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 let's, let's do it today. Let's announce it today. Um, and the, the thing, there was some payback in the way the announcement uh, was made because he actually surprised Robert Kennedy, uh, meaning that he did not give Kennedy advance notice. And so uh, he called Kennedy up and said, I'm gonna put Judge Motley on the phone. Uh, and that is the way that Robert Kennedy learned that Motley had in fact been nominated. And so it's a, you know, a, a funny story about uh, politics and payback and uh, LBJ being larger than life. Um, and then on the, the, the Yankees uh, case, this was a case involving a, a journalist, female journalist, Melissa Lucky, who was a sports journalist and uh, wanted to get quality interviews with the ball players during the 1977 World Series, uh, uh, the Yankees and the Dodgers. And um, the commissioner of baseball would not allow the teams uh, to do a workaround. And so she ended up suing after uh, she had been denied access to the locker room. Um, and uh, the, the idea is basically you want to interview these players when they're relaxed and they're relaxed after they are, you know, when they're showering and, and, and such. And there was a privacy issue. And yet Judge Motley, when she ruled for Lucky, said, let them wear towels. It's not as if you have to, she's saying, you have to be in the buff when Melissa Lucky's interviewing you, but you can't use privacy as a justification to categorically exclude women uh, from their profession. Uh, and so it was, it was one of the cases that caused the greatest blowback for her. People were just outraged. Uh, you know, that combination of professional sports and the Yankees, no less, uh, and uh, men uh, who, who might be unclothed. There are all kinds of stories about, well, what will the wives think? And uh, it, it was just something, but she did decide that case in a way that in hindsight, she, she could only have decided it and upheld by the Second Circuit. A common sense solution, a towel to a constitutional question. <laughs> yes. All right, I, thank you so much. I, I love those sections of the book and I wanted to share them with those people who I know will soon be buying your book from Chevalier. Siam, do we have some uh, questions in the chat? Yes, I think we do have time for one of our audience questions. We have a question from Robert Kraft. Robert says, it's thought that MLK and Malcolm X started far apart, but through the struggle became increasingly close in their positions. Where do you think Constance Motley stood on the axis of MLK and versus Malcolm X? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, and yet I can definitely say that Motley was on the uh, early King side of the equation. She did not appreciate black power. She did not appreciate bombastic rhetoric of the sort that Malcolm X used all the time. Um, she did not appreciate that uh, the black power proponents didn't appreciate the LDF in the way that they should. Uh, and she, on the other hand, was great friends with uh, Dr. King. She represented him. She represented the Birmingham movement um, and uh, distinguished herself by being supportive of direct action. Uh, you know, Thurgood Marshall originally was not, uh, he didn't think very much of Dr. King, frankly. Um, and in part, I, I think it was just male competition. Uh, but it also was that he, he thought that the tactic of nonviolent direct action was irresponsible. Uh, on the other hand, Motley uh, could appreciate it. She, um, she thought that uh, King was an American hero. And so, um, you know, those who see Martin and uh, uh, Malcolm coming together, they're talking about, you know, King as he became more radical. 
Um, but Motley would be on the King side of the spectrum when he is, you know, in the, the early 60s. Uh, she, she thought very highly of him. Thank you for that. I feel like that was the question we had like perfect amount of time for here at the end. Um, do we do we have closing remarks? I feel like I like the question that I like to ask for books like this is like when someone reads this, like what is if there was one thing that they could leave the book with, like after finishing it, what would be that one that one piece of information either about either about Constance Baker Motley or your process? Mm. Well, I would say it's important to look at the civil rights movement and all social movements through the lens of gender and through the eyes of a woman. You can see quite a lot when uh, you, you do that. And that's what we have, have hoped to do in this book. And I would commend it to, to people because there's so many issues that she faced uh, that we still face today. Thank you so much for that. I feel like it's a beautiful closing remark. Um, Bert, do you want to send us off? Yeah, I guess so. I, I mean, this is exactly the evening I hoped it would be. Um, uh, Dean, your book is fabulous. You're uh, so engaging. And to have the current civil rights queen as your interlocutor, Connie Rice, <laughs> made, made for such a special evening. I, I always like to say that while, of course, the rivers of money that pour in from owning an independent bookstore are one very exciting part of the bookstore, there is the fact that we get to hear from and talk with interesting, amazing people like yourself. So, um, Connie Rice, thank you so much. Dean Brown Nagan, thank you so much. Um, it was a great evening, and we appreciate it so much. Yes, yeah, we're getting a lot of thanks you, thank yous from the chat as well. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Take thank care. You. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye. -bye. Bye.